Hello, and uh, first of all, a very uh, warm welcome to Eskil Ebbesen. Hello. And uh, the concept of this uh, playlist or this series of paper is the translation from scientific knowledge into societal impact, and in this case here, performance optimization and, uh, and practice, how the elite athlete uh, trained and uh, the normal concept is that uh, I interview one of the, the authors of the paper. In this case, I'm one of the authors. On the other hand, we had the entire population of, uh, of uh, participants in this study because it was a case study on you, Eskid. Uh, yes. With, um, with data from a very impressive uh, career up here in the, in the left, in addition to the view to peak. Uh, and the peak heart rate and the calculated oxygen pulse, which is, so to say, a measure of the, the output of the heart, uh, the combination of stroke volume and extraction of oxygen. Uh, ex in addition to those data, I also listed just the Olympic medals, uh, five consecutive Olympics in a row, uh, evidence of a long-lasting career and an ability to uh, perform when it mattered. Um, but also, uh, I mean, we can see the aging uh, on the x-axis, the, the age is increasing, and we can also see that the peak heart rate, just like any athlete, just like any normal human being, uh, is declining approximately one beat per year. But nevertheless, you were able to, um, to maintain your performance level, both uh, in the boat, uh, winning medals, but also in terms of, of peak oxygen uptake. Uh, and hopefully we will get a good uh, discussion now. Of how, how did you manage to do this? Well, well uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, the, the, the thing was that, uh, yeah, the, the, the maximal heart rate was uh, was declining over the years, uh, but it seems as if uh, the heart adapted and uh, just uh, pulled out a little bit of extra blood every every stroke. Um, so, so the VO2 max kept on going. So it was really, I think, the mindset of keep training, uh, keep looking for uh, ways to get, get better by in terms of training, diet, uh, optimal training, and, and all those things um, that made it possible to, to, to keep the, 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 the maximal performance up over, over the late years of uh, my career. Yeah, and and no doubt that from a physiological point of view, what compensated for the lower heart rate was, of course, that your probably your heart kept uh, adapting to this and could compensate for a lower frequency by a higher output. Uh, and uh, the funny thing was that we actually measured your your cardiac dimension uh, at the age of forty, not over all of the years here. And I remember because we did only those measurements at rest. And, and no doubt that you had a high uh, left ventricular volume. Um, but the output was not that impressive. If you calculate the numbers here, in, in order to have a maximal uh, a view to max of, of almost six liters with a peak heart rate, which was already low in your younger ages, but let's say with a, uh, with a heart rate of 165 or so, if we calculate the numbers, your output needed to be around 200 milliliters at least which is a very high uh, stroke volume also for a, for a trained athlete. Um, but let's try to get a little bit uh, back to the numbers. Yeah, here. and uh, yeah, I, I just want to make a, a little comment on that. And and yeah, uh, uh, one, one thing is rest. Um, uh, I think also uh, a trained heart, maybe you can uh, say something about that, will be able to uh, uh, keep increasing the... Uh, the volume of the stroke uh, at, at, at higher rates and uh, maybe it will also be able to empty itself more uh, the, the, the trained heart. Yeah, we have actually just recently developed uh, exercise echo protocols in order because we wanted to have better assessment of cardiac function and in particular the filling part. Uh, and you're right that when the, as the heart rate increases, then the diastolic, the, the time allowed for filling also becomes very short. And the whole premise for the, the, the trained athlete heart, which you is so certainly a representative of, is a very, very high 
diastolic filling rate, and it particularly when the heart rate increases. Um, so, but but to get back to the numbers here, one of the things that uh, I mean, of course, at five point nine, almost six liters of uh, of uh, oxygen uptake, which you achieved in your mid twenties, and that you then actually, so to say, maintained until the end of the career at the age of of, of forty, uh, is quite impressive. But what impressed me the most when I have seen you do these six minutes all out test is that already after let's say one to one and a half minute you almost you, know, you have maximal oxygen uptake and your heart rate is very very close to maximal and then you so to say maintain a flat line uh, and and uh, that is extremely difficult uh, pacing or uh, did it take you a long time to adapt to that or how uh, i mean uh, because uh, you you so to say you have an intensity when we look at the numbers in terms of what uh, this uh, effort here is approximately 460 watts and so on. And the 60 of them is, so to say, derived from anaerobic capacity and only part of it from, of course, the oxygen uptake. So you have to be, so to say, at an intensity which is above your maximal aerobic capacity. Um, and if I do these kinds of, I mean, I would mispace it um, yeah, I mean, I mean, we have we have done this a lot of times, and uh, I think uh, right from the beginning of my career, when and I wasn't a physiologist, um, uh, we would just go out hard, and you know, sometimes we would die, and uh, we kind of learned how to to pace it, but um, but but it yeah, was a strategy we, when we, both when you did testing, but also in competition that yeah. the pace in the first, let's say, 500 meters was always higher than the average over the entire 2,000 meters. Exactly, exactly. The first, like, uh, minute, uh, we would do a much higher intensity. Yeah. Um, and, and the strategy, well, we experienced it. It was faster, but uh, but the, the strategy behind it, the physio physiological uh, explanation for it is that... Uh, you, you can kind of increase your VO2 max uh, faster. Uh, you can get closer to your VO2 max, uh, you know, as, as you explained, in, in uh, almost a minute or one and a half minute, you would be very close to your, your maximal oxygen uptake. And, and you kind of, the, the, the whole aerobic part of, of the six minutes will be higher, Um if if you go out a little bit harder yeah. in the beginning, so so to say, the area under the curve uh, of the uh, aerobic component will be will be bigger. Um, but of course, the the challenge is to go out hard, but not so hard that the the anaerobic part uh, gets too high too early. Otherwise, it will cast in the uh, in the other end. Yeah, and that's the delicate balance here that in the beginning, of course, you can have the, the first 10 strokes or so. You can have a very high uh, contribution from uh, ATP and creatine phosphate stores, which, so to say, doesn't cost. But then it, it becomes more and more reliant on uh, uh, glycologic uh, uh, metabolism. And, of course, it drives up the, the, the oxygen uptake fast. Um, and 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 that makes sense in in the competition. Did you also use this as a training strategy? So when you did training uh, yeah. in this type, so so let's because one of the things that is of course that you needed to train here and and rowing is a very high intense uh, effort from an aerobic perspective. All intensities in competitions are so to say above uh, peak oxygen uh, uptake. Uh, but did you also do it in training? So let's say that you had a session where you had to do six times three minutes uh, peak efforts or something. Would you then also, let's say in the first 30 seconds of the three-minute bout, would you also there uh, produce uh, higher power so that you actually, so to say, did a, um, a reverse um, sprint? Yeah, yeah, we would do that. So, so when when we're in when I was in the best shape, uh, I would do around uh, as you say uh, four sixty on six minutes, uh, doing six times three minutes. We would do like uh, 400, 420 watts average uh, with with two minutes break. Um, but we will still go out in like six hundred watts the first like. Uh, uh, 10 15 seconds and and after 
40 seconds we would still be around uh like yeah like 4 460 average and then we go down to to maybe if, uh 400 or 390 uh at the rest of the way which is still above uh maximal aerobic speed yeah but it's quite interesting oh, because that's actually around on on on, on three times uh <laughs> Uh, or, or at three minutes pieces six times we would go just around I think uh, aerobic uh, maximal speed yeah but it's quite interesting because that has actually been a, um, a training philosopher and also strategy and now also evidenced by measures by the Norwegian groups uh, around Bent Rønnestad they have done some where they have tried to evaluate what if you do even pacing what if you do pacing where you start out with a a higher intensity in order to drive up the oxygen uptake. And then they also, their philosophy is that you get more accumulated time at a high uh, oxygen uptake. Uh, I'm not entirely convinced that it, I mean, that it produces a higher uh, training response, but at least that the that is the philosophy. And you could also say in terms, it's probably from the heart perspective, it would see, I mean, if the average heart rate over the entire training session is the same it would probably see the same stress but of course the oxidative stress on the muscles would be higher with this type of uh, of pacing yeah um for our mentality was to 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 you know go for the highest average watch over yeah. over, over the uh, the interval program uh, so so um so no, we would look at in, in, since you as you expressed that the the oxygen kinetics how fast the oxygen uptake increases this is an important parameter because then you can cover a higher entire uh, workload from aerobic uh, energy turnover so of course it would also be good to train in this way yeah 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 so so, so you're mentally prepared for that uh, already after 40 seconds it, it doesn't feel really nice so so if we keep with this intensity part, how many intense uh, training sessions did you have over a week, let's say in the winter, in the summertime? Uh, I mean, all I, I, efforts where you, so to say, elicited peak oxygen uptake uh, during the training. Well, uh, I would say a lot. And, yeah, but um, was it one time a week, two times, four times a week? How many uh, did you approximately yeah, in a weekly I, program? I, I would yeah, I would say four times. Um, but the programs like uh, three, uh, three minutes pieces, like six times, as you mentioned, uh, was one of the shortest programs uh, during normal training. Uh, of course, uh, we did shorter during um, when we got closer to, to competition. But uh, Normally, we would do longer pieces uh, like three times 10 minutes or uh, five times five minutes. Um, and we would also do like, uh, yeah, uh, even uh, three times 20 minutes at, at, at very high uh, intensity. However, you, did we reach maximal oxygen uptake? Uh, no, maybe not on, on, on three times 20 minutes. But, you know, uh, a lot of times we would go really hard at the end of those three times, 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I so yeah, I, brought, I, would, I would guess we would still be very close, uh, at least in the end. I just brought to this because this is then your, your power output during different efforts. And I put the six minutes, which is, so to say, closest to the competition in the four cocktails. The, the competition times was somewhere in the between... 45 and up to six minutes or so right yeah but you're saying is that you did efforts and and the one in the low the open circles is your one hour effort your best one hour effort in the in these years and you said that you did a lot of also longer intervals with you could say slightly lower intensity uh, and then of course you also did some peak when you were closer to competition you the, the the triangles is your one minute efforts and then you have your peak up there at 800 which was so to say a sprint over 10 seconds or 100 yeah. meters or something like that but what you're saying is that a lot of your higher intensity training was also longer intervals but in the domain somewhere between your hour performance and up to your six minutes uh, minute uh, power 
Well, well, um, I mean, when I was best, I was doing these 350 in, in, in one hour pieces. And yeah. um, so let's say that you had a training where you did three times 10 minutes. Would, yeah. you then, would your intensity then be in the area of what you did in a one hour effort or would it be closer to your six minute effort? A, 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 a little a, a closer to one hour uh, pace so a little bit faster than your one hour pace so when we do the the one hour pace uh, we, we have this in rowing we we, we have to uh, the programs are defined by the cadence so like when we do one hour pieces I would do like uh, 31 strokes per minute um but let's say the uh, three times 10 minutes would be a fixed rate at 28 um and that makes the wattage a, a, a little bit uh lower compared to when we had when it was uh when we could do whatever cadence we wanted so i would guess like three times 10 minutes would be around three when we do three Uh, 50 all out in an hour we would do uh, 10 minutes pieces in like uh, 360 or 375 uh, freeze well 70 would be and of course when you were in the ergometer you could get the power output when you were on the water i guess you uh, controlled it more by the the cadency and you used the cadency but in order just to understand i mean 350 360 that would be like around 90 of you to max for you or in in that uh, ballpark or I would I would say I would say free uh, in in rowing uh, I would say that that 360 is is a, a lot more than 90 I would say like 95 96 okay but uh, this was even when you did long intervals I mean it was still from an endurance perspective I mean if we do these zones and I mean all of it was up in zone three so it was all of it was very intense training actually Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, if, Did if, you ever if, have if, any, uh, I mean, uh, programs where the aim was not to, so to say, have a maximal effort, but to have a training uh, session where you didn't uh, want to exhaust and, of course, induce more fatigue? How did you control those types of, uh, of, uh, of training sessions? Yeah, uh, I do that a lot today. Uh, but at that time, uh, we would just call it steady state. So, uh, I mean, if the program was steady state, we would go out and we would row and we would work with the balance, uh, the rhythm, the technique, uh, low, low cadence, uh, steady state, just to get those, uh, that, that, that volume. Okay. Um, so steady state, let's say that you did one hour of rowing around in the, in the, in the lake. What would the intensity be in terms of you could say uh, percentage of uh, of peak? Uh, I would say like uh, steady state would be like uh, yeah, uh, uh, like seven seventy five percent. I would say yeah. So, but this also explains that I mean, most of your training was what we in endurance would call either zone two or zone three or you could have many but all of it would be above the ventilatory threshold one so in terms of I, i mean that may also explain why because when we looked at your data and all the training the total training volume in terms of hours we can return to um, what is actually training volume uh, or load uh, but uh, in terms of total hours you had a much less Uh, uh, training load that example given compared to the Italians or Norwegian rowers uh, around the world and so on but it was quite intense training yeah we, I think the average intensity of our training wa was a lot higher than uh, and than uh, our competitors in, in a lot of the other uh, countries but uh, maybe a little bit uh, lower volume or yeah at least the stories we heard lower volume Um, but we, yeah, definitely, I would say uh, high intensity. Also, our steady state pace, our low intensity was still uh, pretty high quality. Yeah. Uh, we noticed that during competitions when, when we just row our, what I will call our slowest pace, it will still be faster than uh, 
uh, a lot of the competitors and uh, and not because we're faster because i mean we were all almost at the same piece a uh, pace i mean at, at maximal uh, two 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 k pace we would be almost the same level in i mean it, it's uh, over two k it would be yeah. uh, uh, but i also get that in, 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 in in rowing, one of the problems from going from very low intensity to the, you could say, competition-relevant pace is the transfer. I mean, one thing is that you can get the physiological adaptations, but I mean, if you do an entirely different uh, cadency, if your uh, your force on the on the oar is different, I mean, the technique. If you do that in a very either low cadency, or if you have to compromise the intensity by also having uh, less pressure on the ore, I guess that the transfer from a technical perspective would also be less. Well, yeah, uh, rowing uh, compared to like running, cycling, uh, if, especially, I mean, it's, it's a lot more difficult. <laughs> there is the, this, this whole technical part where you have to uh, coordinate uh, not only your own or your own technique, your own uh, 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 balance and all those things, but you have to do it together with with the team. So you have to adapt. You have to uh, work work together. And uh, yeah, you you can have uh, teams that are very uh, good at low cadence, but but have trouble uh, using your uh, physiological power at at high rates but you can actually have it the other way around teams that go uh, very well during high intensity but when they go down to low intensity they they can't balance the boat they can't uh, 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 row no, no, really and good then you could say then the other way around then the transfer from that type of training would be very limited um you, well i've I mean, if you I can't balance the boat, if you can't, uh, if you have to go so slow that you, I mean, it, but the problem is, I mean, now I, we can also uh, touch a little bit about after your career, how you've been starting to do a triathlon. I mean, in, in it would be somewhat similar uh, that when you're running, if you run at very slow speeds, I mean, you have an entirely different uh, exercise pattern compared to if you go... Uh, uh, at least if you do faster running, I mean, if you go in your 10K pace, the 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 stroke, the stride length, the frequency and so on will be different. And of course, it's much more complex in rowing, as you said, because you also need to coordinate with the, the balance and the other uh, rowers in the boat. Yeah, but I mean, a, a trained team would know each other so well that, uh, of course, you can uh, regulate the, the intensity and so on. But... Um, yeah, I think uh, uh, one point that uh, is important to tell uh, today is that um, yeah, we we did a lot of training. Uh, I would say close to VO two max, or at least between eighty and uh, and one hundred percent of of VO two max. Yeah. As we talked about, maybe 2K uh, pace or six minutes uh, pace is, is maybe 120% of VO2 max speed. So, um, but, but we will still keep um, most of the training between uh, yeah, 80 and, uh, and, and, and 100%. And um, that I would call that a, a, a lot of hours. Well, a lot of hours would still be like uh, three or four hours a week, and and then of course uh, yeah. a lot of a lot of steady state. So whereas today, where you say okay, if you look at many of the endurance athletes, they have maybe a very limited, less than ten percent in this domain, and then they have a huge amount in the very low intense domain. Then your was more, you could say. Uh, skewed towards the higher intensity. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, one thing uh, to uh, to maybe touch upon here is: that did you have a large periodization? Because my impression is also that you actually also trained very intense during the winter period. So you yeah. have the actually off season period where your shape was very low. No, we we, <laughs> we almost didn't have a, a you know like a period with with. Uh, with, with bad shape um, of course we would be like uh, 
20, 30, uh, maybe worst 40 watts of our uh, be best pace. But uh, still, I would say very, very stable uh, VO2 max and, and, and performance during the years. And uh, yeah, a lot of our training during the winter in Denmark with, with ice and bad weather would be in the, the, the rowing ergometer. And we would, uh, yeah, we would go for that high intensity and, and uh, not really high volume. And uh, I'm, I'm telling about how we did it at that time. And uh, I think it's also important to tell that uh, we do it different today. I think we do it more like the, 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 the classic that, uh, that the rowers today and the, the training I do today myself is uh, prioritize uh, um, more low intensity volume and... Um, and and less but you still do it's i mean deep, your winter still, training is still you still have the intense part right because yeah, this is one yeah. of the discussion is that people always say ah in the off season period you shouldn't train too hard and you should focus more on volume and not do too much intensity but i think there's evidence also from scientific studies again uh, i think it was a study done in in this norwegian group in in lillehammer where they actually saw that some maintenance i mean maybe not uh, a complete uh, full uh, four uh, hour uh, high intensity during the winter, but some amount of that can maintain. And I also think there's evidence both from uh, swimming and athletics that the athletes who are the closest to their personal records at the onset, I mean, in the spring, uh, they are the one who sets the personal records. So I guess that, that one of the things that I have got from the impression of you is also a mindset that, that if your off-season level drops too much, you will not be able to reach your performance level the next season. No, I I agree on that, and uh, uh, it's uh, well, it's the philosophy. If you want to be be better, uh, you you have to uh, try and uh, add on a little bit, um, and you don't need a whole winter to to have a relaxed uh, period you can say um so so yeah we, we would still prioritize uh, and and still today uh, prioritize uh, very high intensity also during the winter and uh, yeah even even though they do things a little bit different today uh, they are still in 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 very good shape uh, and and performs uh, very well uh, well during during the spring and uh, especially during midwinter, uh, we have we have in Denmark we have the the national championships in in the rowing ergometer during the winter and uh, people do perform. Yeah, and we can also see that in cycling, some of the best cyclists they do cycle cross during the winter, and I mean it apparently doesn't compromise the ability to do well in the spring classics and in the world championships later on the summer. So I think that's good evidence that instead of having this traditional, that low intensity, big base in the winter, and then you intensify and so on. Uh, but but before we get, because I think that this is some of the, down here we have your two, uh, two of your, uh, your books in Danish titles, Think as a Winner and Train as a Winner. Uh, and of course, it, it also requires a very unique mindset in order to be able to do this. Uh, week after week, year after year, and so on, and we may get back a little to this. But before we get to that, I would like to touch a little about um, uh, two things. One is the, the the entire training volume, because you said in 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 terms of hours, it wasn't that uh, big. But how did you quantify volume? I know you had some point scoring system. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> the overall volume wasn't really that high, uh, like 15 hours or something like that. But but we didn't really count our hours. And um, and I had this uh, yeah point system instead, like uh, you, you get one one point uh, for every minute at, at 60 percent of, of your maximal heart rate. Um, and uh, at at uh, at um, seventy five, you would get two points for uh, every minute, and then it increases up to nine points when when you're at uh, at your uh, maximal heart rate. So, so you get somewhat like somewhat similar to the polar trimp. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it was the polar trimp that was the was the counter at that time, and. Uh, 
uh, I was using that to quantify the, the overall training and, and uh, it was goals like that. Um, uh, the training was built up on, and then the points, uh, well... Uh, so that was the, the way the, you the funny, the, the, the funny cal calculation was that uh, if I had, uh, if I didn't have so much high intensity, I would have to do 30 hours of training uh, to get the same points at, at uh, low intensity. And was this an operation? So, so when you said, okay, on a week, I need to have this many points. Let's yeah. say you had a week. Uh, and one of the observations that I have from also from, from your data and training data, but also from some athletes is that some athletes they have, when they do a high volume and do intense training, they have a suppression of their heart rate. Yeah. So did that produce a challenge where there are some weeks where it was very difficult to achieve the points because your heart rate was simply lower? Yeah. Um, uh, it, 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 it was, but, but when you get into a rhythm, when, when you have, to, I mean, if, if you come from a, a low training period, uh, like if, if you had a, a break or you've been ill or you have uh, been injured or something like that. Yeah. The first week would be very easy to reach your point, but you know, already after the, the first or, uh, or, or second week, that the, the heart rate would be suppressed and uh, you find into to that uh, that reference. Yeah. Um, but of course, but that is the day where you can measure power output, at least in many sports, or you can quantify it. It's easier to, to say to use both. Uh, to, to So even though if you have a lower heart rate, but if you produce the same power output, maybe that can be used to quantify. But of course, yeah, in that, those times you were able... Uh, to, to do that. Did you only do it afterwards? Did you only analyze it afterwards? So when you had a completed training, I, did you also use heart rate uh, during the training, so to say, to uh, to um, to gauge the or to to quantify the intensity? I mean, I guess when you were rowing, you couldn't sit and look at your heart rate. Ah, uh, I could, uh, but uh, but I mean, in, in in the rowing machine, we would do uh, pace or uh, uh, yeah the. The, the, the absolute intensity um, but but underwater um, uh, I used the heart rate to, 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 to check whether I had high enough intensity and uh, and and uh, uh, so, use so that. let's say you had a training where you need okay we go steady state and we need to go for one hour the target zone is to be around 80 percent of heart rate max or something would you then increase the intensity if the heart rate was below uh... Yeah, I would, I would, I would try to do that. Yeah. And how would you do it? Would you do it by increasing uh, the 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 overall cadency, so you could say affecting no. the entire boat? No, or? no, no, no. We 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 have a like a fixed uh, pace, like uh, when steady state doing like uh, uh, twenty one, uh, for example, or twenty two. Uh, but but I can push harder in in that cadence, uh, so okay. I can uh, do a, a little bit. Uh, uh, longer so stroke uh, and a little harder push, and and my heart rate would would increase in the in the same uh, uh, cadence. So that was, I guess, also a way that that you could in individualize. Because one of the things is when you have a team, here four rowers. I mean, maybe not all of them could uh, endure the 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 intensity and the volume that you did. Uh, some of them, over, uh, you could say. Uh, uh, maybe some of the younger guys, but also, I mean, it takes some time. Because I, I also remember that you one time said that because I also know that in in, in the hours were distributed across many uh, training sessions. So many days you had two uh, training uh, sessions, and I remember that you said, okay, in the beginning of your career, it was difficult to maybe get a benefit from the second one. Uh, and but I guess when you had these posts, some of the teams you could have younger and maybe also other athletes that could not uh, tolerate so much training. Yeah, and uh, the, we we had uh, uh, well, I've, I've been rowing over five Olympics with with five different teams. Uh, I've been rowing with uh, uh, different people and and. Some people I will call uh, high responders, but they couldn't take the same volume of training. So, um, you know, sometimes they just had to, you know, take a day off and uh, we will go in the rowing machine or um, 
So they had a different target. So let's say your target was 1,600 points over a week. Then there would be uh, be less than that. Or... Well, uh, yeah. And the, by, by that time, um, I was actually the only one who, who did it, uh, like uh, have, having these specific goals around points. We, we had one team that... Uh, f- for some years that was working with it and um, and yeah we, we could go for different uh, points uh, definitely okay. and so uh, have a, the, it was not the same training program I, I mean how did this work I mean you were for guys during the I mean in the winter I can imagine that you could do a lot of it differently but I mean during the summer times the programs I mean if you had a, to go out and have a steady state session or a six times three minutes or whatever you had high intensity I mean then all four guys in the boat would be exposed to the same training. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, over a week with, uh, let's say, uh, 11 uh, trainings uh, on the water, um, we would have, like, uh, I remember, yeah, we, we had, like, uh, maybe uh, nine or... Uh, uh, or yeah, maybe ten in the boat, and uh, and then we would go in the rowing machine uh, or, or the pair uh, for the rest uh, because of of individual uh, adjusting. So you simply so did more training in terms of sessions and total work than some of the others. Yeah, yeah, I, I did in periods, and uh, I also had uh, this. You know, even though we had a week with uh, with uh, eleven sessions, and uh, I would come to Sunday, and I didn't reach my point, I would go down Sunday afternoon and uh, do that extra uh, uh, t- training to uh, uh, to get it, and um, in in the rowing but, machine. So you actually did use the the point system in order to. You could say have a target goal for you could say total training load in terms of the combinations of intensity and volume, and you use yeah. that as an operational uh, marker. Yeah, I did. I did. Is yeah. this the explanation why you could maintain your uh, your almost six liters until the age of forty? Was it that you had this higher? Was the volume required, or did you did you feel that if you lost, let's say that you on this Sunday said ah? I'm happy with these 1500. I don't go for the last hundred points, uh, but you you felt that that was necessary in order to uh, to maintain your level. Um, yeah, I th- I think it was uh, uh, at least one of the strategies to get that little bit extra. Um, if for uh, when when you get into uh, very close to to a world championships or very close to uh, the Olympics. Uh, it it seems as if you get into if you if you had those high uh, volume slash intensity uh, for those important weeks uh, when when you get into the last three or four weeks before uh, the Olympics you, you you just you just have more power uh, and and you will recover faster you will. Uh, Response better, I think, to to trainings and uh, and and be able to deliver more quality uh, for for the last period. And and this is one of the things we need to touch upon because one thing is to be able to have a view to max over all of these years. We can also see that in the test they vary a little over uh, over the years. So some years the performance was four hundred and sixty, others it was four fifty five, and and so on. Uh, but one thing that is very consecutive is that if during when it was the time for the six minute in the Olympic final, you needed to be at your peak. So how did you manage to, you could say, we call it a tapering. How did you manage to peak your performance in these uh, sessions? Uh, did you have a, a, a fixed schedule that, uh, a, a, one question could also be, did you reduce volume? like uh, the classical tape or did you intensify training what did you do in the last let's say 14 days up to the olympics um i think what what we see here uh, at peak oxygen uptake is that the at, that the timing for uh, for the olympics is that uh, the vo2 max increases uh, 
to the year of of the Olympics. Um, and the, 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 the story we didn't talk about is that, the, that um, of course, we, uh, uh, we had time, we were working during training, uh, but at the Olympic years, we would take time off and uh, prioritize uh, uh, training, diet, uh, and especially recovering uh, a lot more. And uh, of course, that that is what we see at the, at the, the maximum. You also had some sabbaticals, we should say, but let's keep out of those because then you did obscure things like dancing and stuff like that. We don't want. To do that. <laughs> yeah, but of yeah, and and the, the thing was that you know training hard for uh, like half a year or a year. Uh, didn't bring me back to that shape. It it took two years. Uh, yeah. and, 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 but and no, no, would... but I was just saying, okay, you, you had, yeah, um, but, I mean, you also would... got the, the experience doing all the regattas, the World Cup regattas. I mean, you had a fixed, did you use the same schedule, so to say, in order whether it was the Olympics or it was a world championship, the last period yeah. up to that? Yeah, almost. Yeah. Um, and it changed a little bit during the years, but uh, we would, uh, when we get into the last 14 days, we would go uh, more over uh, view to max speed. Um, so many we didn't anaerobic do... efforts. Yeah, but, but still, uh, my philosophy was that uh, instead of just doing like one minute pieces, uh, one and a half minute pieces, we would still do like three minutes pieces or uh, uh, well, three and a half minute pieces uh, at, uh, at very high intensity with very long breaks in between. And, and we would do maybe only uh, four, three or four of them. Uh, so, in, ra so in, 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 in race pace. So yeah, race pace or very close to race pace. Okay. Uh, so, so, so we would time it like uh, in in yeah in in terms the program would be like three times thousand meters. Uh, the yeah the competition is, is two thousand meters. And what about the total volume, the weekly volume? Did you also uh, decrease yeah, yeah. that? Yeah, very much. Um, so it was so to say what we would call a classical taper. You reduce the volume, but you maintain or even increase the intensity of the the most quality sessions. Yeah, we we we, we definitely uh, uh, had a lot more low intensity. Uh, we had uh, a lot more. Uh, I would call super maximal uh, speeds yeah. um, above VO two max, and we would definitely decrease all the mid intensity a lot. Okay. So your points would decrease markedly during these periods. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, the points are not really important in, 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 in that period. Uh, no, no, the, no. the points were very important uh, two weeks uh, from, I would say from, uh, from eight to two weeks before the competition. Um, but as I, also, I think a point uh, that that we have done compared to the other question, um, what I have experienced is that at, if if you go very high on those points the year before the Olympics, you just make it easier for yourself in in the Olympic year. Another issue, which is of course very special for lightweight rowing, is that when you did these tapering periods. At the same time, you often needed to be in a slight calorie restriction because you needed to weigh in. Yeah. Was that yeah. a challenge in terms of recovering? Because, I mean, normally what we would see is that people during their baseline periods when they had the high volume and so on, and then when they reduce the volume and if they then maybe decrease their energy intake a little but not a, a lot, then they would have a slightly positive energy uh, balance and of course that would also benefit uh, the the ability to recover and so on but you had to do the reverse because you had to decrease your energy intake markedly in order to to achieve weight yeah and uh, that's a special discipline we have in uh, in 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 lightweight rowing we we simply have to reach that weight and uh, as i will normally say it you if 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 uh, if you uh, have to be a good lightweight row, you have to be a little bit too heavy 
uh, <laughs> when you start. Um, yeah, because then you have a, a large muscle mass, of course, and a large yeah. Yeah, if you, and the potential for higher view to max if you, if you're a bigger person. So, um, yeah. so, so yeah, let's we say would... that we had the Olympics. What would your weight be? Let's say one month ahead, uh, fourteen days ahead, and uh, on the day that you you did the competition. Yeah, my my strategy was to uh, be pretty low at not weight, but but at at the fat percentage uh, before going into the. The, the four weeks before the Olympics, so. Um, but you uh, had to weigh in at what 72, 72.5 kilos. What yeah, was the maximum? Yeah, seventy two point point yeah four to be exactly seventy two point five. However, uh, going and, into and what would your weight then be? Let's say one month ahead of that. Yeah, sixty five, sixty five point five maybe. So four kilos above, uh, but. That's that was still a challenge for me to get on that weight, uh, and and that would require a, a very low uh, fat percentage just to get yeah. down on on on, on, on uh, seventy six, which my normal uh, winter weight with with uh, would be like uh, seventy eight, seventy nine, or uh, yeah. yeah. So, but in order then for you to reduce from the you could say three four kilos above to be only two kilos or whatever above one two days before weighing in then you would have to be in a calorie restriction yeah yeah and at the same time you needed to be fresh enough to do the very intense training because that was your strategy did that uh, was that a challenge in order to be i mean uh, if you limit your uh, your ability to have uh, filled carbohydrate uh, glycogen stores and so on could you still do the intense training or, or was that not a problem because you reduced the volume um I think it's a uh, it's it's an extra discipline, and uh, I I think uh, one of the challenges is is to uh, time your uh, your energy intake, your your carbohydrate in, uh, intake, and of course protein. And one of the things we would prioritize uh, very hard was to eat fast after training, uh, so so that that the, the calories and the carbohydrates. We, we get we, uh, we start off immediately after training and um, yeah I just to uh, also just to keep uh, fat in the in the diet low so so the energy we get was primarily from carbohydrates and of course we had to get our our proteins but I think timing was a was a an important part of it also we would do like uh if we we knew we had to only go for a, a low intensity steady state uh, i would eat less uh, because uh, i didn't have to perform so i could go it's it's okay to be a little bit low on energy a little bit tired for that uh, so you also prioritize the the diet in these uh, uh, yeah, a, a lot. Yeah, and and uh, you know, going up for the very high competitive uh, intensity trainings, uh, I would do a little bit extra uh, carbohydrates to be more ready for that. And and maybe well, also a very uh, extreme practice of fuel for the work required, as we have done now, to say okay, if you only need to run a five kilometer, you don't need, to, or in this case, a fifteen hundred meter, you don't need to fuel as if you had to do a marathon. Whereas when you did the large volume in the, in the off season and so on, then you could fuel more like an endurance athlete. Yeah. 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 So it makes sense. But of course, the balance is not to go so low that it compromises muscle function and the ability to have the intensity. Yeah. So, so we, we would, uh, yeah, we, we would, uh, you know, try and time the diet. So, we would eat uh, all our meals uh, and, and you know extra meals, uh, but uh, to keep it uh, just just a little bit under uh, what we needed. But I mean, it would still be like in in, in training periods, it would still be like eating uh, four or five thousand calories. Uh, did oh, you monitor six, this? Did you uh, did you calculate it, or was it more like? Uh... Uh, as you felt or as you uh, no actually I, I, I'm, I'm well a lot would use that that strategy uh, but um, my experience was that uh, I had I had to to calculate not very precise but um, 
you know, uh, years of training, I would uh, I would calculate and uh, in in my head and uh, you know maybe maybe write it down. So you did some rough measurements. Uh, yeah. of what was needed and so on. I also exactly. know that when you had to weigh in, you had an entire okay, 100 grams of carbohydrate. That would imply 400 grams of extra body weight on the morning after and so on because you knew that. And I guess that was a way of extreme learning your own body to because you had to weigh in at 72.4, otherwise you were not allowed to compete. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, it, 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 during the the, the last uh, 24 hours, we yeah we 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 would eat less carbohydrates uh, to 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 get down on that weight, and um, and we have to be very aware of uh, how much. Uh, well, intensity we would do because I mean when you're low on on carbohydrates, it's it's like they just disappear from the muscles so fast, and um, so uh, so you know just like you know standing up, walking a lot of round, we would uh, decrease that to to really hold on to that uh, glycogen in in the muscles. And I guess then it's an entire story that within the Olympic week, then you did the initial, the semifinals, the finals, and that was every second day. So you need to time and you need to re replicate this procedure because you had to weigh in on each of these occasions. Yeah, um, exactly. And th th that's a lot about timing. But uh, but still, I mean, at, at that period, over, I mean... Over like 48 hours, we would be, uh, 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 well, uh, a calorie equal to, to, to what we actually burn. So, uh, so it, in, yeah. in, in that case, it was quite easy, yeah. One last thing that I think I would like to touch upon is uh, now you have written some books, both about the mindset, how you thought of optimizing everything, and that was from your own training to the diet. And also to an awareness of maybe that you could tolerate more work than the other rowers in the boat, uh, but also in terms of how you have developed the uh, training programs. And I know that you're in a really good shape uh, even now here, ten years after your career. Uh, so you also have uh, have you could say translated some of the mindset and so on to kept thinking at least about how do you keep uh, as a further aging uh, athlete. Um, but how much of the things when you now today uh, guide and help a younger athlete, how much of that is taken from your own experiences and how much of it do you try to extract from, because I know that you also uh, read a lot of uh, scientific uh, papers and keep assured on, on the newest no knowledge on how to train and uh, optimize training. How do you try to balance these things? Yeah, I, I try to balance these things because uh, I mean we we all develop, we all uh, get more uh, knowledge uh, during the years. Uh, I mean, you're 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 a scientist. You you always ask the question, <laughs> uh, what what is what can we do better? What what can we get more knowledge about? So 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 yeah, I I, I try to adapt to newest. Uh, uh, science but however i got a lot of experience and in uh, from from my career and uh, a lot of things that i uh, not much talked about and uh, so um yeah i mean when 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 i get an athlete uh, uh I, I don't like, uh, well, I, I'm asked to be an expert, uh, expert in a, you know, very specific area, but, but uh, what I would do is to ask around everything, uh, alive from a very holistic point of view. Yeah. From a very, very above and, uh, you know, helicopter view, uh, holistic, yeah. as you say, like it's not only about, uh, optimal training, optimal diet. It's about uh, who's around you, uh, how's the structure of your day, uh, what else do you do in your day that takes a lot of energy, um, what is your mindset, uh, how do you go into training, uh, how do you think about the program and the progress and, uh, and the long-term goal. So it's, you know, um, 
it's it's like a 360 view of of uh, the whole daily life and uh, and then i think the challenge is to ask the question uh uh what changes sh uh, should we do to 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 make that progress? And uh, sometimes it doesn't start with with optimizing uh, like the intensity of the training or, uh, or 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 the diet. It could simply be like uh, structuring your day, uh, finding out what to say no to in your everyday life. Um, uh, I think that's uh, one of the biggest cases I admit that that is that we do uh, use a lot of time and energy on, on things that, that doesn't give you improvement and that uh, might cost you time and energy. No, no, that but you I think that is very one of the essential. Yeah. One of the essential is when you, if you become very detail orientated, of course, as you said, Okay, we have focus. How do we optimize our post-exercise meal in order to do this, in order to have weight? But you don't lose the overall picture. Uh, so I think that that is one of the balance and one thing that could say, okay, you have new knowledge from one study. Okay, this specific type of training and this intensity is more optimal than that type. I mean, if that compromises the big picture that you forget uh, uh, this, so, I, but I, but but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't focus on how we optimize a single detail. That's what I have at least experienced with you is that, I mean, whether it was trying to optimize if we could get a little additional out of uh, the weighing in procedure or supplementation with sodium bicarbonate and so on, but you don't lose the overall picture is still to uh, be able to have the consistency in your training uh, and uh, and all of this. Exactly, uh, exactly. We we should look for uh, all the small details, and uh, we have definitely done that uh, into very very <laughs> small details. But however, uh, only details that doesn't cost speed, as 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 we say. Like uh, yeah. we have tried a lot of things that would be too complicated uh, to 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 make it uh, function in in, in practical. Uh, I think we we had this. Uh, for example, we had this. Uh, uh, you know, the science about that we should do production training, like, you know, very high intensity, like going uh, uh, 30 seconds, 40 seconds at very high intensity and would do that like uh, six, six, eight or even 10 times. Um, but uh, what we experienced was that, um, yeah, we, we couldn't just add on that training. I mean, it cost a lot of, uh, yeah. it's a tiredness that that uh, caused that when we do our, our VO two max training or our audit training, it would uh, uh, yeah compromise the quality and the intensity of the other training, and so uh, we concluded that that wasn't uh, something we should do a lot. And and surely this is when sometimes when you read the read the literature, then you have occlusion training, then you have heat training, which we practice now. Then you have and and the thing is that it's not an an equal sum because I mean when you as you trained you already probably have put so much different types of training so much optimization into the overall program that if you add another things then you should remove something yeah because otherwise exactly. it would overload yeah. the system uh, and that is of course the balance to find okay what if we optimize some some details of course you can optimize without it costs on others but if you focus too much on one detail, trying to optimize that, if then you lose other parts. And of course, that's one of the difficulties, so to say, by being a practice in here, uh, yeah. translating it. Um, and, and then you could, of course, always do trial and error. Okay, we tried that and then we uh, fatigued or we tried to increase the volume and so on. But on the you need to have a fine way to to calibrate this over the, the, the time course, I guess. Exactly, exactly. And we did use a lot of time on, on testing different things and, and trying out different things together with you also and team the Danish team Denmark, uh, uh, testing uh, different uh, things. But um, we were also very aware of doing that during periods where we didn't have to... Uh, you know, perform at our maximum. 
but it's uh, it it has been a very important part of our uh, development and uh, and our performance, I think. Yeah, and from a motivational perspective, I guess that you always used a lot of goal setting. So you set this goal for this training session and so on in order to either beat the other competitors in the row or, uh, or so to say, fulfill your target goal. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we we would do that. Uh, well, yeah, almost every training. Uh, you know, we 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 have a. We have a goal. We have a, a, a meaning with this uh, this training. Uh, what should we focus on? Uh, what should we uh, achieve in, uh, on this training? And uh, yeah, both on water and you know in in the rowing machine would be it would 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 be very simple. You know we have an, a very good idea uh, about what intensity are we able to should we beat in in this training. Now, Eskil, uh, you had a long career and uh, this has also become a somewhat uh, long talk and we could probably uh, keep on discussing uh, training and physiology and the mentality uh, because, I mean, uh, this is some of our favorite uh, topics uh, to discuss. But uh, I think that we will have to refer at least the Danish uh, viewers to the, the books where they can uh, read some of your interesting uh, thoughts about this. And then maybe I will invite you to a later podcast where we can maybe discuss further on how you integrate details from scientific new studies to the overall picture. Uh, but um, it was uh, both a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, in, in the days when we did the article, it was really funny to dig into all of these physiological data collected over a 20-year career and, uh, and looking how... Uh, how you manage to uh, to keep up the shape and uh, it as a physiologist some of the data uh, also surprised uh, me and uh, was was very impressive so um, yeah many thanks for the for the talk and uh, for sharing some of your thoughts and experiences yes thank you very much and uh, i enjoyed the uh, talk very much myself and uh, looking forward to maybe the next time great see you and uh, see you. yeah bye